Uh, next talk is by Margaret Glasgow. So she's from uh, Stanford and she's gonna talk about approximate brain coding via random graphs. So Margaret. Can everyone see my slides? Yep. Yes, we can, yes. Let me just play it. Okay, so I'm Morgan Lee, uh, and I'm gonna talk about approximate gradient coding via random graphs. And this is some joint work that I did with two undergrads I work with, Patrick DeMichelle and Alex Moriera. Uh, and so I think the motivation here will be pretty familiar to everyone. Um, like in many machine learning applications, we're trying to minimize uh, some sum of functions and often these functions represent individual loss functions and we're in a distributed setting where we have a lot of machines and each of them have individual data and this data is used to construct some loss function um, which we'll just call fi uh, and then all of these individual machines can communicate with a single parameter server um, so this comes up in like uh, data centers or maybe even like a federated yeah, learning center where center. these devices uh, aren't all in the same place. Uh, and one way to solve this optimization problem is via distributed gradient descent. So at each iteration, you might have the parameter server communicating a current iterate theta t to all of the different machines, and then they all compute some gradient of the data that they have, and they send that back. And then the parameter server aggregates all the gradients and takes a gradient descent step. So this works very well. Um, but one problem that comes up with this is something called stragglers. Um, and so that's when we have some machines that are slow or unresponsive. And this is very typical in settings where uh, we have many machines. There's always one where like something's going on or maybe more than one um, that are slow because they have other work going on on them or other like random events that may affect their ability to respond quickly. And so if at every iteration we waited for all of the machines to respond, it would take a very long time. Um, and so instead we want to build some strategy that's redundant, that has some redundancy so that uh, it's robust to having stragglers. Uh, so in this talk today, we'll talk about two different models for stragglers. Um, we will uh, let S be the subset of stragglers. So if there are M machines total, there'll be some subset uh, that are slower or unresponsive that we can't rely on. Um, there's two models for them that we'll discuss. One is when we have random stragglers. Um, so there'll be some parameter P and each machine will be a straggler independently with probability P. And then a second model for stragglers is when we have adversarial stragglers. Um, and in this case, the set of stragglers can be arbitrary, but the size of it is bounded by a P fraction of the size of the total number of machines. Uh, and so one idea that's been proposed before uh, actually originally in work of Tandon et al, which I'll cite later, um, is called gradient codes. And this is a way of building redundancy into the data that's stored at different machines so that you can recover the full gradient even when some of the machines are stragglers. And so the way that they model this is with something called an assignment matrix, which is an N by M matrix where N is the number of functions or the number of like data blocks and M is the number of machines. Uh, and in this matrix, we have the IJ entry is non-zero if machine J stores the function I. So for example, you can see in this, this mini example of this matrix, and I'll just say in this first column, which corresponds to the first machine, um, there's a one here uh, in the first entry and the second entry, and that's because this machine has access to data one and data two, so it can compute the gradient of F1 and F2. Okay, so how do we use this and implement it? So it's actually pretty simple. Um, we're still in this distributed setting and in each iteration, we have the parameter server sending theta t out to all the machines. But then now at each iteration, all the machines that don't straggle are gonna send back an aggregate of the gradients that they're able to compute. So I'll call this aggregate gj coming from machine j. And what they compute is the sum over all data points that they have. Um, this, of this linear combination of gradients with the coefficients aij. So here, they're, it looks like they're summing up um, all of the gradients of all of the functions, but really they only have access to the ones where aij is non-zero. So this is probably gonna be a pretty sparse sum. And then they send back this aggregate to the central parameter server. And then using this, these aggregates, the parameter server can take a gradient step. So the most naive way to do this is for the parameter server to just sum up all of the gradients that have been sent back to it. Um, 
and then use that as a proxy for the full gradient. Um, but depending on which machines are stragglers, maybe the parameter server will know based on the distribution that some uh, functions have been overrepresented or underrepresented. And so to deal with that, the parameter server can more cleverly combine the gradients by adding these coefficients wj in front of the gjs. Um, and that will sort of allow the parameter server to up to upweight uh, gradients, aggregate gradients gj that it thinks should be more heavily represented based on which machines are straggling and which ones are not. Are there any questions there? Because that's the model. Okay, great. Uh, and so I'll just summarize this really quickly algebraically. So we have an assignment matrix A, which is an R n by M, um, and it's going to be zero in most places. Um, and then we're going to have each machine is computing this aggregate gradient over all the data that it holds. And then the parameter server is going to be taking this update step based on uh, linearly combining these GJs. Um, and just another way to write this is that the gradient step ends up being theta t minus uh, the step size times the sum over all i of the vector, the ith coordinate of the vector aw times the gradient of uh, function i. Um, and so this 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 way of writing it allows us to see the individual contribution of the gradient fi, which is important because our main goal is going to be that this total aggregate gradient looks something like the full gradient. So we want this vector aw, which is going to be a vector in rn. Uh, the number of functions to look something like the all ones vector at all rn that's our goal so we'll formalize this on the next slide uh, so when we're designing a gradient code there, there may be many things that we desire but i'm going to highlight two goals that trade off with each other that's going to be the focus of this talk um, and so the first goal is that we approximate the full gradient well um, so formally we can define this thing error of s and a where a is the assignment matrix and s is the set of machines that are stragglers to be the minimum over all vectors w that we could use to linearly combine uh, the gradients that come back that don't straggle. So all w such that they don't include uh, components for machines that are straggling of the distance between uh, the vector a w and the all ones vector. So this is the quantity we care about. Uh, for the reason that we said that before, we're going to get this update. The full gradient is, oh no. Actually, sorry, that's a typo. So the full gradient should not be a w i to just be a one there instead. Uh, OK, so um, this is our goal to make this small. And we care about it both with random stragglers. So this is an expectation over a random choice of s or the adversarial error, which is going to be the max overall sets s of size at most pm of this error quantity. Um, and this trades off with another goal we have, which is to minimize computation. So like one easy way we could do this is just give all of the machines all of the uh, data blocks and they can compute the full gradient. And then if all the machines besides one straggle were doing great. Um, but we want to keep the number of functions per worker small because that corresponds to the amount of storage and the amount of computation they have to do. Um, and this corresponds to keeping the columns of A sparse. Uh, and we'll call the sparsity parameter uh, the number of non-zero entries per column of A to be D. OK, so I'm going to summarize some prior work. Um, so uh, first, people were looked at exact gradient codes, which is when we can always recover exactly A1 equals to all ones vector. Uh, and and Ye and Abe uh, established that to do this, you need uh, the redundancy D to be greater than the number of stragglers. Um, and so this can often be really heavy if uh, like this can be very non-sparse and require a lot of work at each machine if the number of stragglers is a constant fraction total. Um, and so now they're all, I'm going to talk about approximate gradient schemes where they don't get an exact AW equals one, but they get close. Uh, so one well-known one is the fractional repetition code. And that just looks like this picture up on the right where you repeat these blocks of data at many different machines. And it gets a random error of P to the D when the stragglers are random and adversarial P uh, there's some other constructions, the regularized PGC, it doesn't do particularly well. Um, there's an expander code, um, which is based on the bi-adjacency matrix of a certain uh, expander bipartite graph. Uh, and that gets, because the expansion of this graph is very good, it turns out that turns into having very small adversarial error. So their adversarial error looks like something like P over D, uh, which is great because it decays in D 
as opposed to this fractional repetition code where it doesn't. Um, uh, people used random graphs to come up with something called a batch raptor code. This uh, also had pretty good random error, but the, we don't know if it has good adversarial error or not. Um, actually, uh, Salim and Mary uh, uh, and Vitar uh, also worked on uh, something called a pairwise balance scheme. Uh, this rate decayed with P over D. Uh, and finally, a couple years ago, I worked on some work with Mary uh, where we designed graph-based assignment schemes. And the purpose was to do well on both the random and the adversarial. Um, and we got a pretty good rate on that for the random error that looks almost as good as the fractional repetition code, which is optimal. Um, and we did a little bit better than the fractional repetition code on the adversarial, improving by a factor of two. Uh, and so the question, uh, okay, so you can see the best rates uh, here uh, for the fractional repetition code or for the, for the random error or P to the D, but for the adversarial error, it's significantly worse, which is P to the D. Both of these rates turn out to be pretty much optimal. You can't do better than decaying like P over D for the adversarial error or better than P to the D for the random error. But so far there's no code that's able to simultaneously achieve both of these rates. Uh, and so that's the question behind uh, this work that I'm about to present, which is can you get gradient codes that perform well both for random and for adversarial stragglers? Uh, or is it hard to come up with assignment matrices that have favorable properties for both? Because um, in some ways, it seems like sometimes the properties of the matrix trade off with each other. So the fractional repetition code that does really well uh, in the random case, it has a lot of repetition, and that seems to be good for random. But uh, having more like randomness and expansion seems to be better for adversarial settings. OK, um, so I'll state our results really quickly. Um, so this is the definition of the error again. Uh, and just says that we can construct assignment matrices where the random error is something like p to the d minus little l of d. So that's almost optimal. And then in the adversarial case, uh, we get something on the order of p over d. OK. Um, and I'm going to really quickly go over construction. Uh, it's pretty simple. Um, we call it the ABC code, augmented by regular code. It's based off of a by regular graph. Um, and so the way we construct it is um, we make a random bi-regular graph where the left nodes have degree D and the right nodes have degree D over gamma for some small constant gamma. Maybe you can think of gamma as two or three. Um, and then we look at the bi-adjacency matrix of this where these index rows and these index columns. So this is gonna be like a short and fat matrix and we call that A and then we layer a few copies of A on top of each other until we get a square. And this is our code. Um, and so a cool observation is that in order in to, well, it's because cross to get control, someone's thinking. It's analogous in some sense to sampling variants from clients on top of them. So you're sampling just a subset of your clients. Maybe someone can mute. You're not seeing the data from all of your clients. Okay. So Folks, if you're not presenting, could you please mute yourself? I can't see if anyone's not Sorry, so muted. Okay, that seems good. Um, okay, so recall our goal is to bound this random decoding error, which turns out to be the more challenging quantity to. Themselves is open for those clusters where a sensor belongs to a single cluster. Oh. Benedito, could you mute yourself, please? It happens to be located between two clusters. Okay, I think I figured out how to mute him. Uh, great. So um, our goal is to bound this um, this decoding error in the random case, this expectation of the distance between A, W, and the all ones vector. And here I'm calling it AS because it's A with the columns corresponding to the straggling machines removed. Um, and it, it, this is the key con quantity we care about because the adversarial error turns out to be pretty easy to understand based on the expansion of that bipartite graph. Um, and so the idea is that we can relate this quantity to the number of linearly dependent rows in uh, this submatrix AS. So it's this top matrix with all of these random columns removed. Uh, so bear with me as I go through a little bit of linear algebra. Uh, so uh, the reason that we're able to reduce this to caring about the number of linearly dependent rows uh, is let's say, uh, let's say D is some set of rows involved in linear dependency. So I have this matrix 
A and I have this set D. Um, so I claim that if the vector EI, which is the vector with all zeros besides a one in coordinate I, is in the column span of this matrix, then uh, it means that uh, row I is not involved in any linear dependency with the rows, the other rows in AS. And the reason for that is if there's a row uh, which is linearly independent from all of the other rows here, then we can find some vector wi, which is orthogonal to all the rows besides row i. Um, so the dot product of wi with all the rows is going to be zero, except for its dot product with row i is going to be one. And this is really uh, important because it allows us to construct a vector w um, such that we can get as times w is close to the all ones vector, which is what we wanted to do. So I claim that we can find some w such that w dotted with this matrix is going to be zero. Um, in the areas corresponding to the rows involved in linear dependencies, but it's going to be one everywhere else. Um, so the way we do this is we sum up uh, all the vectors wi for i not in, uh, sorry, this should be i not in d. Uh, and then we get this vector, which is very close to the all ones vector. Okay. Um, and so the only thing we have left to do is actually figure out how many of these rows are involved in linear dependencies. And our key here is observing that linear dependencies in random matrices come from very small structures. So for example, uh, actually don't mind the pictures so much, but they might come from uh, uh, a row that's just all zeros and that's a very small structure or maybe something we call it a cherry, which corresponds to two rows, uh, which have uh, one, one in them exactly in the same position. And this graph corresponds to the graph that would be, would have adjacency matrix given by the, uh, the matrix we're looking at. Okay, and so we can formalize this, uh, these definitions into something called minimal dependencies, uh, and they correspond to the smallest structures of linear dependencies that exist in the graph. Uh, and I'll go through this very, very quickly, but a minimal dependency is when I have K linearly dependent rows where every subtract, subset of the K rows is linearly independent of each other. So this is sort of the smallest structure of a dependency where you can't have dependencies inside it. Um, and I'm not going to go through these properties right now, but one fact that you can observe is that all of these minimal dependencies must have at least 2k minus 2 non-zero entries in them uh, if they have k rows involved total. And so the main technical theorem uh, behind our work was characterizing all of the linear dependencies that occur with high probability in this matrix with the straggler columns taken out. So if we have this matrix that comes from this bipartite graph, uh, this is our design matrix for the gradient code. And then we look at the sub matrix where we remove these random columns. Then we showed that with high probability, all of these minimal dependencies have a very particular structure. And the structure looks like one of these th three things. Um, and in particular, you don't have to understand these pictures, but the linear dependencies have exactly between 2K minus two and 2K non-zero entries. So we have a very fine grade understanding of where the dependencies come from. Um, and that's great because uh, it shows that all the linear dependencies are really small. And so we can actually just count them up to get a bound on the size of that set of all the rows that are linear dependent. And that directly gives us a bound on the decoding error. Uh, OK, I see I'm basically done with time. Uh, so yeah, I have one more slide, which is just a few broader takeaways of this, uh, which is it turns out we can prove a theorem like this for other kinds of random graphs. And this is uh, something that people in the math community have been interested in. So I thought it was cool that this work that came out of gradient coding had some other implications for sparse random matrix problems. And so um, we could prove a same kind of theorem about uh, dependencies having these structures in random graphs with just IID entries, either they're symmetric or not. And this gave us uh, control over the rank of random matrices. Uh, so in conclusion, really briefly, we talked about gradient coding which is when we have a uh, distributed setting and some machines are slow. Uh, we introduced this new code based on biregular graphs, which had good adversarial decoding error and random decoding error. And the way that we proved that was showing this theorem about random matrices where we could find all the linear dependencies. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Margalit. And uh, clapping for you. And sorry for mispronouncing your name at the beginning also.